As you find your way back to your seat, I'll invite you also to find your way to Luke chapter 21. We're going to remain in Luke uh, just for another week. We spent most of our Lenten season and even Holy Week there. Luke chapter 21, it's page 1055 if you're using the Alive paperback. And um, it's, a, it's an interesting passage. Uh, Luke chapter 21 is parallel to Matthew chapter 24. In fact, right after worship, if you want to come up and see, um, in, uh, for the past while I've been studying uh, parallel Matthew 24 with Luke 21 and all the words that are the same and the way they say things just a little bit differently. And so I, I made some notes for myself. You can't read them where you're, from where you're seated right now. But if you want to come up afterwards, I'll just share with you some of the way that I study Scripture and um, maybe you'll find it helpful, too, to study that way, or at least be able to see how those Gospels match and how they're parallel, and it actually helps us to understand Scripture a little more when we lay those passages side by side. So I was reading through Luke uh, for Lent, and one of these passages, uh, which is a, a Holy Week passage before the crucifixion, just stuck out to me because it's so contemporary. And so I studied it and then set it aside, and we're going to talk about uh, Luke 21 this week and Matthew 24 next week, because the context here is that the chief priests and the teachers of the law were questioning Jesus about his authority. Here he was coming into town, and he was saying things that they didn't appreciate or approve of. He was living a particular life that they thought was either harming their leadership or somehow was harming the heart of God. And so they tested him, and they tried him in a bunch of different ways. That one day, uh, after he rode into town on a donkey, he even went into the temple and he flipped the tables over, the table of the money changers, because he said that this is a house of prayer and you've made it a house of profit. It's an amazing thing how much they disapproved of Jesus. The Sadducees, who were a leadership group along with the Pharisees and the scribes, they didn't believe there was a resurrection. So they, were, they would test him with particular trick questions to see uh, if he could maybe blaspheme God so they'd have a reason to kill him or something like that. But it was a, an anxious time as Jesus made his way, set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem and the cross. They questioned Jesus. Are you the son of David? Are you the son of man? Are you truly the Lord? By what authority do you teach these things? Into that context of all those Holy Week conversations and of all the things that Jesus talked about, this one stands out. Jesus actually talked about the signs of the end of the times. And it hit me. It's fitting for us to talk about the signs of the end of the times from the scriptures because it's in the air all over the place. It feels more imminent today. I hear a lot about the weather and the terrible weather. I hear about wars and rumors of wars and the fight for political power. This is all end of the world stuff for some people. And I'm typically not a signs guy. I don't know if any of you remember a Sunday that we've taught about signs of the end of the time. Unless, unless it's Jeff Foxworthy, I don't talk about signs much. Seven of you. All right, next time. But the truth is, I am watching. I am waiting for Jesus to return. And if he returns today, my testimony, my confession is that I'm ready. Say yes if you are. And if it's in a billion years, if that's the heart of God, that his heaven is so big that it's a billion years from now and at the banquet table you can't see from one end to the other, I don't know. It's up to him. But I'm ready. No matter if he shows up and I'm taken into the sky or if I face death and am translated and regain a new body in the resurrection, I don't know. But the scripture is very clear about how, how you can live and what you can know so that you're not fooled. So next week, we'll look at Matthew chapter 24 about the days of Noah and what it's like to live in a world where people aren't watching, where they're not waiting. And then after that, um, we're going to jump into a series out of the book of Judges, which one of the refrains in that book is, and people did what was right in their own eyes. And it will help us understand how the believer lives in a contemporary world. All right? So let's have a prayer. And, uh, and then we'll jump in. Pray with me. Father, I, uh, I pray that over these next few minutes, um, I will have no other words than your words. So help me to teach truth. 
and send your spirit into this place to translate those words in the air that it might fall into our hearts, that we might hear your word, understand your word and your will, that we might remember and believe, and that we might stand up from this place to be gospel bearers, to be heralds of the good news, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them and to teach them so that we all might be ready. Father, I pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to jump in at Luke chapter 21, and our text is going to show up somewhere around uh, verse 5 or 6, but listen to these words from verses uh, 1 through 4 first, because context matters. Um, In fact, when you read the Gospels, uh, and you don't have to follow me there on the camera, I'll just point. But our text is about where the green line is on there, and there are some verses that happen before that. And there's a particular kind of study when you study the scripture. It's called redactive criticism. It's about how how did the authors of the Gospels uh, order the stories, the words, and it it helps us when we read just what happened before because it sets us up for what's about to be said. Almost always that happens. So let's look at verses 1 to 4 because it will get us ready for our text today. Here's the word of the Lord, Luke 21. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Jesus was making a contrast, right? The the contrast between the rich and the poor, between giving gifts out of your wealth versus putting in copper coins, which is the last of what you have. It's about some people who have everything and give a little of that, and some people who have very little and give everything. I mean, we could take that into a tithe principle. It comes out of uh, that we give the first of our crops or that we give the first of our herd or the first of our income, saying, our hearts are saying when we do that, that we trust God to bless the rest. This text helps us to understand Jesus' teaching about signs, which we're going to get to in a second. When we begin here, when we understand about putting the kingdom first, to be kingdom prioritized is primary to Jesus, humbly trusting his plans, his promises, It's about being rich to the kingdom, not to yourself. It's the treasure principle. You know it. Fill in the blank for me. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Exactly. Think about that as you hear the teaching about signs. All right, here's the word of God from Luke 21, verse 5. So Jesus is walking with his disciples. And verse 5, here's what happens. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. Remember, if this is analogous to the previous text, to be adorned with riches is not the point, right? It's about having the heart, the readiness for relationship with God. But Jesus said, verse 6, as for what you see here, The time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Jesus is speaking prophetic truth. Jerusalem will soon be surrounded and overrun. The physical temple will be destroyed. We know it historically, 70 AD. But the kingdom of heaven and the lordship of Jesus will be enduring because the kingdom of heaven is not that physical kingdom that we see with our eyes. Like giving and tithing is about your heart beyond the physical coin. To give two pennies or $2,000, that's a heart issue more than it is a coin issue. Signs are like that. They're beyond the physical. It's more than an event or an earthquake. Listen, it's more than just an event out of the news. It's about your heart and what's going on in there. The destruction of of the temple would be a sign, the sign that there's a season of spiritual darkness coming. In the Old Testament, we hear about it all the time. The prophets, they have a word from the Lord, and then there's no word from the Lord, and people have no vision, and so we'll learn in Judges again that they did as they pleased because they forgot about God. 
And now the New Testament, Jesus shows up. He's the light of the world, but John says the light of the world came, but they didn't even recognize him. They wouldn't receive him. They preferred the darkness. It's always about your heart. Sound familiar? Mankind loves darkness and evil. It says in John 3, 19, they prefer the darkness. But somehow inside, we secretly want signs so that we'll know when to look and where to look. That somehow we believe this distance from heaven to earth, that when Jesus comes back, if we have the signs, if we know when it's going to happen, we can get everything in order, right? I don't know. Let's see. Jump in with me at verse 7. The disciples now talk back to Jesus because he just told them the temple would be destroyed. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to take place? Interesting questions, right? When is this going to happen and what will be the sign? They're wondering, how, how will we know? I mean, if, if I could know the signs, Jesus, then I'll be able to pay attention. They asked when and why. But they didn't ask, what do you mean? How should we wait? What must my heart be like to endure? So I wondered about that. I wondered about why do people have this need to know, right? I mean, why do we want physical signs to see? So I came up with just a couple of reasons. One is, um, I think that knowing the terminus helps us. Like in a race, you know how long to swim or how long to run. Or when you have to hold your breath, you know how long you have to be able to do that. How long is this going to take? It's even on the car ride to spring break. Alabama's a 1,000 miles from here. Are we there yet? We all want to know because then we know, long, we know how long we have to endure. I think the human heart, the way we think when we have a terminus, we know how long to run. I also wondered about how that helps reduce anxiety. When we know stuff, it's like, all right, I can put up with this for a little while. You go to the dentist and he says, you're going to feel a little pressure. Nuh-uh, it's a little pain is what that is, right? I think knowing helps reduce anxiety a little bit. And we don't like the anxiety of not knowing. But I think most importantly is that our nature is that we want to wait till the last minute. Remember the parable of the landowner? Matthew, in his gospel, actually puts it on the heels of this story about how the landowner went away for a while and then he came back. And it says in there that you should be found doing your job, that you should be doing your work because you don't know when the landowner is coming back. It might be in four months, it might be in four years. So don't wait because it's going to surprise you. Finish it for me like a thief in the... When you least expect it. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's addressing our natural need to know and wait to the last minute, right? Because we know when we see a sign, that's when we need to get things right, right before it happens. That's that distance from heaven to earth stuff. When we see the sky rip open and we hear the trumpet blast, do we think we have 30 seconds to just get it all in order? I want to do what I want until the last minute and quickly get my ducks in a row. I think that's human nature. But surprise, we don't know. The point is we need to be ready every day. In fact, that's the whole point. Jesus addresses our anxiety and he tells us to be enduring and steadfast because you will know when he's coming back. At that moment, you will know. You'll know the signs. You don't need to run and look when people say he's here or there. You don't need to run because you will see him no matter where you are. Not my words, his word. Follow me into 1 Thessalonians 5, 4. Just a few words that are on the screen. But you, brothers, are not in the darkness, so that day should surprise you like a thief. When you're ready, you're not surprised. Jesus isn't playing mind games here. It's not word tricks. It's, it's not a riddle. His return will be when we least expect it. But if we're ready, it won't be a surprise. This is a call to trust him with what we don't know. Trust him with what you don't know about the time of his return. And when you trust him, your anxiety is reduced. When you trust him and you know you need to be ready every day, then it doesn't matter what day the master comes back. Just be ready. We know how to live between now and the day of the Lord. It's less about reading the signs than it is about being ready. 
We'll know when it happens, the scripture says. He will come to us visibly, not in secret. Think back just 110 years ago. There was a group of people who said that Jesus was coming back, that was going to be the day of wrath in 1914, and then Jesus didn't show up. It didn't happen. It didn't change. And so they changed their story. The Jehovah's Witnesses says Jesus came in secret, and he's ruling from up in heaven, but he left us here. We're the ones who get to tell you. So they predicted that Jesus came invisibly, anointing witnesses. That's not at all what Jesus said. We're going to read it in Luke 21, verse 27 in just a second. But there are some things that we need to know. There are signs of the times. There are seasons. Jump in at verse 8. We're going to see antichrists, plural. Note that, plural. We're going to see natural and national disasters. Here's the word of the Lord. Jesus said, watch out so that you're not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming, I'm he, or the time is near. Look at what he says, do not follow them. We don't need to run and find Jesus, he's coming to us. Verse nine, when you hear of wars and uprisings, don't be frightened, these things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Isn't this contemporary? People are saying, here he is, there he is, the time is near. We hear of wars and revolutions, don't be afraid. This is how we wait. We don't follow every wind and wave. We don't have anxiety. Watch out. Don't be deceived. Don't run after them. Like you need to go find Jesus. He will come to you. Wars and revolutions are happening, but it's still not time. Matthew 24, verses 23 to 28 um, has a, a really good word here so that we can be confident and endure. And we'll talk about this next week. When they say to you, go and look there or here, Jesus says, don't you will see him. All right, back to the text, verse 10. Luke 21, verse 10. Then he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes. Wasn't there just one in Taiwan? There will be famines. Somalia and Africa is coming out of a 40-year famine. Pestilences in various places and fearful events. Look at that revolution that's happening in Haiti. The missiles in North Korea that are being tested over the waters of the ocean. And great signs from heaven. Is that total eclipse tomorrow? Is that tomorrow already? Huh. Has anyone heard of the meteor Apophis? It's going to be making its way into our uh, orbit in 2025 and then again in 2029 or something like that. And so scientists are watching it. These things have been happening for centuries, and we see them in our news today. So I think here's the point. Jesus is coming back, so be ready. I mean, here it comes, not just in other nations, not just in other states, not just in other points in history. It will come to the believer. There are signs for us to know. Verse 12, look for personal disaster or persecution. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They'll hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you'll be brought before kings and governors, all on account of my name, and so you will bear testimony to me. And somewhere, I think on that document right there, I highlighted it in blue, there's a reason that we're going to be brought in front of the judges, so that we can give a witness and a testimony and speak of the gospel. Our trials are our opportunities to bear that testimony, to speak the truth, and to trust God, like Daniel in the lion's den like the three friends of Daniel who were thrown into the fiery furnace who said, I don't know, God can save me. We believe that, and if he doesn't, we'll still praise him. Stephen, standing before um, uh, the church leaders, gave a witness that he saw the Son of Man standing in the heavens, and then they took his life by stoning him. Sometimes the signs of the times that are our trials during spiritual darkness give us an opportunity to be light. Can I get an amen? And so we should. This is an effort to trust God no matter what. Even the apostles said, don't worry. The worst they can do is take your life. They can harm my body. Okay. No one can take my name out of the Lamb's Lamb's book of life. Amen? It's there forever. And so you will bear testimony to me. And then he gives them an instruction on what to do while they wait. During those seasons of darkness, Jesus is helping us, his followers, with assurances so we can choose now before there's trouble. To set our heart now 
before the storm shows up. Verse 14, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you'll defend yourselves. I'll give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You'll be betrayed by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they'll put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a, he a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. And then Jesus circles back around to Jerusalem being destroyed. Verse 20, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, and you will know that its desolation is near, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of, the punishment, of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and be taken as prisoners to all nations. Doesn't this sound like our news? Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Times are seasons. This season is when the gospel goes into all the world until the times. This sounds like a commentary on our world news. Famine and persecution, war and death. The nation of Israel. There will be many signs and seasons of trouble and disaster and persecution. We will be betrayed as he was. We will be hated as he was. But let me tell you, you are also loved and protected as he was for he will never uh, abandon you or forsake you. God's wrath, the scripture says, is not reserved for his children. Jesus took that. He took our punishment. All of our iniquity was laid on him. And by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed and forgiven. We celebrated that in communion on Maundy Thursday. We remember it again today in the sacrament of baptism that because of and by the blood of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. We are adopted into the family of God. The Holy Spirit is sent to us every day to renew, strengthen, and restore us as we look forward to our hope, the resurrection unto eternal life. Amen? That's what it's like to be ready. I know some pastors were in Washington a year or two ago rattling the gates that surrounded the Capitol, speaking to their congregation about the end of times. I know others who are talking about dates and signs, but the thing I want us to walk away with today is that we must all be ready, for we don't know the day of his return. We are so loved by God and protected as he was. His wrath is not reserved for us. So today, do not be worried, do not be anxious, but instead choose to be confident in him. Trust him. These signs remind us to be ready, to be watching, to trust what Jesus said. They are the signs of the times, but they're not the sign. And Jesus was very clear saying all these things are going to be happening all throughout history, but there is this moment when you will know when I come back to you. Luke 21, 25, listen for the words, at that time you will see. This is the sign that we're looking for. In uh, Go uh, Matthew's gospel in uh, chapter 24, the word there is immediately after all of these times of distress, this sign will appear. Creation will be dismantled. Listen to the way Luke writes it in 21:25. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and with great glory. When all these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your head, because your redemption is drawing near. This is the sign, and you will see it. The skies will tear open, the heavenly bodies moving aside to make a way for his return from heaven. 
Not from another place that someone should say to you, go there and you will find him. Not to another nation. Every knee will bow before him. Every person will see his face. All of us will know. We'll all see him come down. Matthew 24 says it's like lightning that comes from the east but is seen in the west. It will be obvious. That's the sign. It's that simple. So don't be confused. Don't be anxious. Revelation 14 says it this way. I looked and before me was a white cloud. Remember the clouds at the ascension of Jesus? And the angel said, don't worry, he's going to come back just like you saw him go. There before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, one of my favorite passages about that day. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This year, we're going to hear a lot about potential signs. Rumors of war and nations at war. Even civil war. And weather changes. And floods. And drought. That asteroid we talk about making its way past Earth. We're learning more about black holes because of the telescopes we sent out. We're learning more about other planets and people still keep looking for another place to escape to. Some are even looking for other beings on other planets. I don't know what God has out there. We'll probably fight each other this year because of the news. And we'll go to the war game on November 4. And every day before that, newscasters will spin conspiracy theories and there will be a heyday of this could happen or that could happen and you watch the barometer of anxiety? But choose this day to not be anxious for the king of creation is seated on his throne and there is nothing that happens to his church unless it comes through him first, amen? So don't be afraid. States and cities will choose sides. There will be personal threats, potentially riots in the streets. Oh, that would never happen, right? Family ho uh, holiday gatherings might be a joy this November. Hang on for the ride. And depending on what's reported on November 5, maybe most of Hollywood will move to Canada. <laughs> I don't know. It's what they said they were going to do last time. I don't understand. Here's what we don't know. We don't know when. The scripture says that the angels don't know, the son doesn't know, but when the father is ready, he will tell the angels and then they'll tell Jesus and the skies will be ripped open and we'll hear it, we'll see it. That's how it is. We don't know when that day will be. The day and the hour are only known by the father. So don't be anxious. Some of us are full of anxiety and we feel like God is obligated to tell us, if I'll, only I knew when, when will these things happen? What will be the signs so we know? We have to know. We have the right to know. Oh my, what we do know is that Jesus is coming back, just like he said, and for the reasons known to God, it's better for us not to know the day or the hour. Here's what Jesus did tell us. There will be signs, signs that say he's coming back, and we know that. And there will be a day, and on that day, every eye will see him, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is the Lord. And every day until then, I'm going to invite you to bundle up all of your questions, all of your fears, all of your anxieties, even your desires and demands, bundle it up all together and cast it onto Jesus. 1 Peter 5 verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So resist him. Stand firm in the faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. 
And the God of all grace who called you into eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a little while, whatever that season is, he himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be power forever and ever. Amen. There are signs, and they are reminding us he's coming back. And they are a call for us all to be ready for that day when we see the sign when the heavens are opened and Jesus returns on the clouds just like he said. So now we know. Don't be fooled. You already know what to look for. Jesus coming down from heaven with a trumpet blast and every eye will see him. So let me leave you with a question. Are you ready? Come back next week. We're going to talk about what it's like to live in a world that doesn't care. Let's close in prayer. This is from 2 Peter chapter 3. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we know that in the last days scoffers will come who do not follow you, but instead follow their own desires. They will scoff at those waiting for your return. They will forget that you keep your word. By your word, the heavens and earth were formed, and by your same word, judgment will come upon those who are ungodly. Father God, you sent your word here, your son, that we might have life. And you said that you will send him back to gather up all the redeemed when just when you say it's time. But today we confess we struggle with time. Waiting is hard. Not knowing is hard. And we fail to wait well sometimes. So help us instead to take advantage of the time and be reconciled to you and to tell as many as we can Jesus, we know that as soon as the Father sends you back and the skies tear open and the angel blasts the trumpet, uh, we'll see you. The new heaven and the new earth will be established and righteousness will dwell with us. But we also know it will be a terrible and frightening day, like the days before there's war and destruction and persecution and pestilence. It will seem like the whole thing's coming apart. So help us to be faithful, to be watching for you, to be ready. Cause us to have understanding of your word, to trust your plans and your timing, to be stable in believing. God, keep us faithful in believing and living in covenant with you. We have been warned, so help us to be on guard. Help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forevermore. Amen.